a lot of my clients were using bitters. Okay. You know, and bitters really help to stimulate the digestive tract. So I'm asking them to do it about 10 to 15 minutes before they eat. So that kind of makes them stop, get in the mode, and understand that we're about to eat. Even the act of cooking is a great way to get into the mode. The way I really like to get rid of uh, damaging habits is to swap them out with other habits. So this might be a hard sell for some people, but doing, you know, having a tea ritual mm -hmm. instead of that alcohol. Uh, doing something that you really enjoy, even you know, watching a television show that really you know, helps you de-stress. Taking a bath, you know, going for an infrared sauna, going for a walk after work. You know, doing all these things that help to process that stress, but aren't necessarily adding harm to the yeah. body. Hey there, it's Mike Mutzel. Welcome back to another episode. It's episode number 165, and today we're gonna to catch up with Canada's leading nutritionist, Josh Gatalis. I didn't know this before recording the podcast with him, but Josh is actually booked out until May of 2017. And when we recorded this podcast, I think November 10th or something, it was over six months. So he really knows what he's doing. He's got a busy, thriving practice. I've met a lot of nutritionists and great functional medicine practitioners over the years, and none that's as busy and as astute and as a good of a clinician as Josh. He's trained in both nutrition and functional medicine. So we're gonna cover advanced concepts related to the basics. So, you know, we can't build a, a house unless we have the proper foundation. You can't build your desired body and get rid of disease and improve your mental performance and outlook on life unless you have the proper foundation. And that proper foundation starts within the GI tract. So we're really gonna start out with digestion and he's gonna transition into exercise, into top supplements, lifestyle tips to shift bad habits and much more. So, but before we start, in the spirit of Thanksgiving, I just wanna thank you for tuning in. You know, without your questions, without your comments, without your thumbs up and you guys subscribing, I would not continue to do these podcasts. I'm inspired by you, I'm grateful for you, and I'm grateful for all the wonderful guests, including Josh and many others. So my hat's off to you. Thanks for sharpening the saw and tuning in to these episodes. I really hope you get something out of them. Your feedback means a lot to me. So any questions or comments or thumbs up, you can click the link below this video. And just a little plug, some of you didn't know that I wrote a book back in 2014. And so if you wanna learn a little bit more about digestion and motility and gastrointestinal function, leptin release and, and muscle tissue, how to build muscle, it's all in the link below this video in the description of the YouTube video. Also, Josh's wife, Megan, has some wonderful cookbooks and a fermentation cooking course that we talk about in this podcast. So be sure to click the description links below because you have a lot of resources and tools there. So with that, as always, I appreciate you tuning in. Now let's dive into the show with Josh Gatalis. Hey folks, welcome back to High Intensity Health Radio. It's Mike Mutzel here. I am super excited that you're with us because today we're gonna talk a lot about nutrition with my friend, Josh Gatalis. And I think Josh, a great place to launch is, uh, so I do some online coaching and stuff for weight loss. And one of the questions that comes up is I feel like I've restricted all this, the, you know, the gluten, the dairy, the corn, the soy, the sugar. I don't know what to eat. Like these are the questions that people, people run by me. So let's launch there because uh, you eat, cook, eat and cook via your wife and yourself. Uh, you guys are amazing chefs. I follow you on Instagram and we'll put the links below this video to your Instagram handle. Um, it's, your diet is certainly not boring, but you're cutting out a lot of the allergenic food. So when people come to you and see that, where do you start with them? Right, so I mean there's certain things that are non-negotiables, like the evidence is just there that it's not good for us yeah. and uh, so many people are sensitive to those types of foods. So I think for most people, the top ones that come to their mind are gluten and dairy. So most of my clients, no gluten and dairy. And I think the evidence is there to say that gluten is probably not good for almost everyone. When it comes to other foods, that's when I think, think things get a little bit hairy and a little bit interesting because if I talked about each food that someone might eat, mm -hmm. I can think of a reason for each one why they might not be healthy or beneficial following and subscribing to different diets. So you know, when you're in the nutrition field, you come across so many different types of diets and angles on things that, uh, you know, if you're someone that hasn't been in it for a long time, it just gets super, super confusing. Mm -hmm. So part of what I do with my clients is an investigative process. We always start with a diet diary at least four days. Uh, we have food and mood. So I see how they feel, how they react to certain foods, how they 
uh, interact uh, with their food in their environment as well. Are they eating at a desk? Are they eating at a table? Are they eating in their car? Are they eating standing with their kids? Um, and then we're trying to make some correlations that way. And that's kind of the first step in terms of determining what the best diet is for them. Um, Let's I, pause right there. Yeah. Sorry, I don't want to mean, oh, interrupt sure. you. But I think that's a really critical step. And a lot of practitioners are not really addressing that. So you're talking about like being mindful when you're eating, really what it comes down to. So uh, what have you found with people? Are they mindlessly eating before they see you? So they're on Instagram, they're standing, or they're on, in the subway or on a bus. Or, have you found that to be pretty common? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And our digestive tract does not turn on unless we're in rest and digest mode. Mm -hmm. If we're still in fight or flight mode, sympathetic nervous system, you know, go, 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 work, 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 um, digestion doesn't shut on, we're not going to make hydrochloric acid, we're not going to get our enzymes to get activated, converting pepsinogen into pepsin, we could go into all of that, but yeah. you know, we just don't allow for that digestive process to happen. And people are eating in their car on the go, and they're not, and you know, it might not seem that much of a problem one time or two times or you know every other day but when people are doing it week after week month after month year after year they're not digesting properly mm -hmm. and that's where everything begins and everything ends so if you're not digesting you're not getting the nutrients you need and that can lead to obviously much bigger problems along the line yeah and so you mentioned gut health and various components of gut health right there and, and mindful eating and how that triggers that the normal digestive process like you talked about. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of clients come to you with gut health related issues. So uh, what have you noticed in terms of like clinical feedback when people start doing the mindful based eating and we'll talk about recommendations that you give to them um, in terms of gut health because that's another huge question in addition to oh my gosh what am I going to eat after I eliminate this stuff is that I have chronic like a, there's a brick in my stomach I get gas and bloating my stools are tarry you know all those things that mm -hmm. you hear about. Um, how big a factor is mindful eating and gut health? Such a huge factor because yeah. if we think about digestion from the top down, from the first step to the last step, it actually starts, digestion starts outside of the body. Mm -hmm. The cephalic phase of digestion is all about the senses, what we hear, what we smell, um, the experiences that we have beforehand. We all know that we digest way better when we're in a restaurant with some nice music, the lights are dim, we start to smell the food, and that starts to activate all the juices. And this is a tremendous opportunity to actually start the digestive process. Um, we all know the experience, like even if I just mentioned today, you know, think about biting into a lemon, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You know, the, the salivary glands start to I go. I feel it, yeah. Yeah, and that's just a thought. We haven't even put any food into our mouth. Then we have the opportunity to chew. And uh, you know that's our first chance at mechanical breakdown and our only chance. And the rest is chemical. And most of us don't even chew properly. No. Are you even familiar with the, the guy Fletcher? I don't know him. No. Yeah, he, he invented, I think he was like practicing many, many years ago when they had these places people can go for healing. And he invented something called Fletcherizing, which is based after his name where people should choose a, chew their food at least a hundred times. Mm, okay, I have heard that, yeah, it was gotcha. Yeah, and it's a little bit excessive. There's a great book written uh, entitled Gulp, and she talked about what, how long she would actually spend chewing, and she said it would like be most of the day. Wow. She'd be finished chewing and be time for the next meal. So that's a little excessive, but most people are not chewing, they're just like wolfing down the meal. Mm -hmm. And um, again, they're not letting that digestion to turn on. That's huge, you know, because so many people are focused on the macros and the low calorie. And is it gluten free? Is it organic? And we're forgetting just the actual process of, of mm -hmm. chewing. So mm -hmm. I'm glad we're covering the fundamentals because that's when we like met a couple months ago. We're like, let's talk about the fundamentals and take a deep dive on a whole new level. So, um, what tools is there to induce mindful eating? Like, there, is there timers on the iPhone? I know some personal trainers I work with recommend putting the iPhone timer on 15 to 20 minutes and that's how long you're going to sit and eat with no social media, no Instagram, whatever. Uh, what other tools do you have? You mentioned like chew, visualizing a lemon and like causing that cephalic phase of digestion. Like walk us through your little toolbox to help mm -hmm. people uh, learn, relearn how to eat. Definitely. Well, yeah. I think um, you know, right around the meal time, deep breathing is a good thing to do. You know, there's a reason why a lot of indigenous tribes and religions and cultures have a moment to say thanks for the food. You know, it just makes you stop and get into that phase. So that's a really great thing to do. A lot of my clients were using bitters. Okay. You know, and bitters really help to stimulate the digestive tract. 
So I'm asking them to do it about 10 to 15 minutes before they eat. So that kind of makes them stop, get in the mode, and understand that we're about to eat. Even the act of cooking is a great way to get into the mode because if you're cooking your meals and taking a little bit of time to prepare them, you start to smell the different aromas, you get to work with the food, and you know that meal time is around the corner, so that gets you in the phase as well. Yeah. So these are all really great things to do to sort of get into the mindset. I'd say like the two extremes, one extreme is the window diet, right? Mm -hmm. We pull up in our car to a window, we grab our food and we eat it. Yeah. There's no activation there. The other extreme, what we were built on from thousands and thousands of years ago, years ago was sharpening our spears, gathering our friends, going out into the field, tracking the animal, finding it, hunting it, killing it, dragging it back, building a fire, having nice conversation, processing the meat, cooking the meat, and then finally eating. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a long process and that really helps you get into that phase. Right, yeah, because uh, you'll probably at that point are, are borderline starvation mode, really, really hungry and just a mat, just, you know, the anticipation really drives that digestion. Uh, but so bitters, uh, I know mm -hmm. they sell di digestifs at mm -hmm. like, like liquor stores and stuff. Mm -hmm. Are you recommending that or like bitter, uh, like vegetables? Cause like things like berberine, for example, different herbs, um, frise, arugula, like some of those compounds. So let's talk about like the supplemental standpoint and then real food that maybe can be used to augment the, the digestive phase. For sure, let's talk about food first because that's yeah. where it should all begin. Totally. Yeah, so over the years we've bred our food to take out the bitter. We like the sweet, we like the crunchy, we like the juicy, you know. Yeah. Um, if we think about iceberg lettuce, that's been bred over many, many, many years, and it's very low in nutrition. If we look back at wild lettuce, which is still in our environment today, it grows around here uh, quite readily. If you ate a piece of wild lettuce, it'd be like so bitter, you wouldn't be able to have any more. And it's a, there's very strong medicine in there. So there's actually um, very strong painkillers that you can harvest from wild lettuce. And those alkaloids have very strong medicinal activity as well. So, and then we have things, you know, kind of along the spectrum, like some of the things you mentioned, like arugula and frise are, have that bitter principle. And they're great things to have as part of a meal to keep digestion activated and to have that bitter effect while you're eating. Mm -hmm. Another one's dandelion greens are pretty bitter. Yeah, mustard greens, I love those too. Mm -hmm. uh, ruby steaks or streaks, I can't remember, I, I don't know if it, but I grow them uh, and oh, they're cool. absolutely amazing. Yeah, so they're like a mustard green mixed with an arugula. So they're kind of skinny, Ooh. but they really have a nice punch to them. And so I didn't mean to interrupt you and get you off track, but the, the thing that's challenging for a lot of people, if, they, if you don't grow your vegetables, the grocery store just has limited options, spinach, Swiss chard, arugula, and mm -hmm. you're kind of narrow. So uh, you mentioned, I know you get your water from a, a reserve somewhere out in the woods and stuff. Are mm -hmm. you harvesting your own vegetables too? Um, sometimes. So like we love to forage in the in the summer and in the fall, like in the in the in the seasons where there's not snow everywhere, yeah. we uh, love to kind of look and learn and find stuff. So not enough to really sustain us at mm -hmm. this point. Obviously, because we live in the city too, and we only venture out there yeah. um, in small doses. But uh, there is so much food to find. One of our favorite things to do, first thing um, when things start to sprout in the woods up here, is wild leeks. Wow. Have you ever had wild leeks? No, I'm curious to learn more. Oh, they're delicious. They, they're kind of garlicky with like an oniony flavor, kind of mm. mild. And they're the first ones to come. So if you go up north in the forest when everything starts to spread, that's all you see everywhere. Hmm. And they've got a delicious leaf that you can saute up and they have also a delicious bulb on it. Um, we don't harvest as many of the bulbs anymore because they're becoming endangered. Really? But the flavor is just so powerful. And our taste buds, we know when we're eating nutrition. Mm -hmm. Like we know when we're, we found the goods. Yeah. So we, we do find some great food. We, we find berries throughout the season as well. Lots of great berries up there and amazing herbs too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which this sounds very exciting and I'm personally interested in learning more, but for folks listening, if they shop at Whole Foods and Costco, they're like, I'm not gonna go forage for my own food, right? Like, yeah, that sounds cool, but is it safe? Am I gonna get something toxic? So. Uh, any books, resources, websites that you can direct people to. So if they're interested in hiking and getting a little food, which I would highly encourage people to do, 
Like, where did you learn how to do some of this? Oh, stuff? absolutely. So, um, one book just before it uh, escapes my mind is yeah. Eating on the Wild Side. Okay. Amazing book, and what she basically talks about is all the foods that you see in your grocery store, yeah. where they originated from, wow. and how you get the most um, authentic version of it in your grocery stores. Cool. So it's super practical. Yeah. She talks about how to store them, how to cook them, and everything. There's a few things I don't fully agree with in the book, but that's a discussion for another day. Yeah. And then just wherever you you are in the world, mm -hmm. try to find people in your local environment that know the wild plants and just go out with them. Yeah. So this past summer, um, I went on a mushroom foraging uh, uh, just kind of day with a local mm -hmm. mushroom lady. Yeah. I think she's the mushroom lady on Facebook or something, and I learned a ton that way. Like cool. just uh, added it to my to my roster, my toolkit. Um, you know, when after, a couple of years after I got out of nutrition school, I went down to Ohio to a place called United Plant Savers. Mm -hmm. And it's just this herbal sanctuary with like tons of herbs and wild food. And it's just a, a, a lush place for these types of plants to grow. And it's because of that, it's attracted many herbalists. Wow. So they had an intern program for about six weeks. I went down there, I got to handle the herbs and plant them and harvest them. and walk around with different herbalists, and that was just a tremendous experience. Yeah, that's And I huge. think, yeah, I think that wisdom is something that's been lost um, over the years because we don't live in tribal communities anymore, so we have to seek out these people for that information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, we go to Facebook or YouTube and we can find some things, but you don't really know always the source and, and stuff like that. But I wanna kind of pause and, and really underscore the importance of what you're talking about. It's not just about being some, free living human, which we are recommending, you know, but uh, Lauren Cordain has done a lot of research, you know, he's kind of mm. the founder, the modern day founder, along with uh, Boyd Eaton of the Paleo Diet. And he's working right now with Western Plains uh, Native Americans, and, and he finds that the amount of different tubers that they eat, like you mentioned the wild leeks in mm -hmm. the early spring, these folks are eating like between 90 and 100 different types of tubers. Wow. And so, you know, we talk about gut bacterial diversity and improving digestion and motility and all this. And a lot of people jump to probiotics and fermented foods, which is totally awesome. But, you know, this food first principle, uh, you know, really, we need to underscore the importance of that. So step out of, outside of your comfort zone, folks, and go forage and read this book, Eating in the Wild and doing different things. I think that's really cool, Josh. Um, so we took a big sidestep. Let's go back. We talked about uh, arugula and frisee and, and radicchio, some of those compounds. and. The, the wild leeks, um, digestif, uh, you know, different compounds before a meal. Mm -hmm. Where do we start there? If someone is like, ah, that's too out there for me, I just need a supplement or whatever, mm -hmm. what do you do? Yeah, so we, uh, we have some digestive bitters that we use. It mm -hmm. just comes in a tincture bottle. You just do a little squirt in your mouth before the meal. Yeah. There's some herbs that have this bitter principle. And the way we developed the, the mechanism of ramping up digestion from a bitter taste is you know, poisons sometimes taste bitter, and that's how we've sort of figured out what's poison and what's edible over the years. But these herbs, so yeah, our digestion ramps, ramps up to try to deal with that poison as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Mm. These herbs are medicinal, they're obviously not gonna kill us, they're beneficial, and they have that bitter principle in them as well. Uh, some examples would be dandelion root, um, artichoke, uh, one of the most bitter herbs is gentian. Mm. Uh, you mentioned berberine, that's pretty bitter too. Mm -hmm. um, we've also got like calamus, turmeric has some bitter principle to it. Ginger is great for digestion, so it's in a lot of formulas. Mm -hmm. So, And when you combine these, you get this beautiful synergistic effect where uh, the sum of the parts are much greater than, you know, cool. just, just accounting for each one of them. Yeah, and so 15 to 20 minutes before a meal, take deep breaths, maybe cook your own food instead of putting it in the microwave or buying it through the drive-thru, like you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, and the power of community, I think we, we talk about it, but not too many people, um, well, some people live alone. I do hear that from folks, you know, if they're mm -hmm. retired or whatnot, mm -hmm. and the spouse unfortunately passed away. But what sort of advice do you have for folks to like eat with others, like-minded souls? And like any tips there? Because I'm sure you, that happens where you have a, a single, you know, young working professional and they don't have people to eat with and uh, that's a big part of the process. What do we do then? Yeah, I think it's great to uh, look for people in your community, like-minded individuals, go do a cooking class. Mm. That's my wife's specialty. I mean, yeah. she started here in Toronto doing uh, small cooking classes for four or five, ten people and now she has a program that services or has serviced, you know, over a thousand people in like 
40, 50 different countries. Oh my gosh. And that community has opened up so much for those people because they're like, oh, there's like-minded people that are so interested in food. Mm -hmm. But that experience of just eating and sitting with people, I think is, is you know, almost at a spiritual level and being able to enjoy your food in that context. We've yeah. become so disconnected from our food that I think our digestive tract doesn't even know what's coming into its, its system when we mm -hmm. eat a lot of these foods, both mentally and physically. And of course, we know there's a very strong uh, mind-gut connection when it comes to digestion. Yeah, important point that you bring up because a lot of research has actually shown that the gut hormones released from the small intestine and so forth that affect insulin and blood sugar regulation, appetite and satiety, we know these are down-regulated in a lot of you know, North Americans, right? So we do see the rampant diabetes, insulin resistance, obesity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. a big, big piece of the puzzle and that's where we're really taking a deep dive into this topic. Something else comes up uh, while you're speaking there, and, and I get this question a lot. Like, it's usually the, the female of the household, the mother or whatnot, the wife that uh, wants to eat healthy, but husband, boyfriend, fiance, kids are not on board. I'm sure you've heard this a lot. So, what do we, you know, I have my tips and stuff. I'd love to hear your, mm -hmm. your perspective there. I think an important piece of that is just getting everyone to participate in the meal at some level. Mm -hmm. You know, give them a knife, give them a shredder give them some salad to wash and just get them involved. You know, kids are like sponges. I don't have any kids yet, but you know, I have like seven nieces and nephews and I just see, you know, like whatever you feed them, mentally and physically, they're gonna take. And um, you know, get them in the kitchen, get them cooking, get them working with the food, get them understanding where the food comes from. I think taking them to a farm mm -hmm. is a really cool experience. Like kids love that stuff. Yeah and um, just get them involved at a really early age. Yeah, that's really big. Um, but what if the spouse just doesn't want to eat vegetables? Uh, what do you do? I mean, so like cauli rice, uh, spiralized zucchini noodles, you, I, mean, I know your wife has amazing recipes. Um, any help there transitioning a husband or it's usually a male that doesn't want to make the shift to, to healthier foods? Yeah, we deal with this all the time and I yeah. think it's just slowly introducing things. Mm -hmm. You know, so maybe you start by sneaking it in and in a tasty manner uh, and then you keep on adding more and more. Maybe there's like a little salad on the side, maybe there's a vegetable incorporated into the rice mix and then you just slowly add that on. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe that we move towards the truth. Yeah. And healthy eating and healthy food is the truth. It's much more truer than processed bad food. So when people get introduced to these concepts, they eventually gravitate towards them after maybe they've gotten past their resistance. Yeah. They may not be so open-minded or, or uh how should I say this? They, they may not have like a, a poster that says like, yeah, my wife was right. I need to eat up. But they'll slowly start to you know, make these lifestyle choices and make it their own idea. That's what I found Absolutely. with clients I've worked with, which, which is fine. Um, okay, smoothies. Let's talk about that. You know, because I, Robert Crayon, who passed recently in 2011, I believe, um, was a big fan of smoothies because we're like breaking down all those micronutrients, more bioavailable. Um, some studies at Duke University have shown that smoothies do have a satiety effect. They stimulate the gut hormones and so forth. Um, but the downside, we're just talking about slowing down, eating your food, being mindful. We know people can slam a smoothie while they're driving in their car. Tips, what, what are your thoughts on smoothies? Yeah, yeah and I, I know how I feel just from personal experience. Like if I have a smoothie super quick, which I've tried before, mm -hmm. I just don't feel good. Yeah. Right? I didn't turn on my digestive tract. So even if I'm having a smoothie, I like to take a little time to make the smoothie, sit down, drink it in a, about the speed that I might consume a meal. Mm. And then maybe take a few minutes afterwards, five, 10 minutes to just let it digest. And that's when I feel way better with a smoothie. Another nice thing to do is you eat a little something with the smoothie to kind of get that chewing to slow down a little bit and to get that digestion activated. Yeah. That's a really good tip. Mm -hmm. So treat it as though it's a meal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think people like the smoothie concept or idea because it's quicker than a meal, but that's like circumventing the process. And anytime we try and shortcut something, usually it doesn't work out in our own health, right? So it takes 15, 20 minutes. I really like that. Um, tea, coffee. There's different people that suggest that if you wait for your adrenals to kind of set in the morning, then you have coffee two hours later, 
I personally like coffee first thing in the morning. It kind of helps to wake me up and so forth. I know you have a lot of training in functional medicine. You've been working with people. What are your thoughts on caffeine in general? Oh, that's such a great question, and there's such division on that topic. Yeah. But I like to look at all angles as usual. So I was a coffee drinker way back in my university days, and I know how I felt, and I know what it did to me. So I feel like it just drained me over time i got more and more dependent on it mm -hmm. when i stopped drinking it i knew that there was a chemical dependence on it and i knew there just some wasn't something right about that um, when i started studying uh, nutrition and functional medicine um, i learned more about caffeine and i and i felt like and i feel like working with all sorts of clients that most people don't thrive on consuming coffee every day maybe one two three a week if they're not physically dependent on it it drains the adrenals, it tires them out, um, and they're working on artificial energy, which yeah. I don't like. Like, I wanna know how they actually feel after eating a good meal mm -hmm. without that coffee. Yeah. yeah. Now, some of the research says, like, there was a, a study done on Costa Rican men uh, looking at uh, genetic mutations, uh, sing like SNPs, mm -hmm. single nucleotide polymorphisms, and seeing you know, if you're a fast metabolizer or a slow metabolizer, if there's benefits or downfalls. And what they found was the men who were fast metabolizers uh, had a lower risk of heart disease. They were drinking four cups. They, they, they did this experiment with men drinking four cups a day. Wow. And those with, those were, were slow metabolizers had an increased risk of heart disease. Mm -hmm. So that's like one study that I've seen where it sort of depends on your physical biochemistry, you know, whether you're able to tolerate caffeine or not. Yeah, that's a really important point is personalizing. Just because the guru says drink coffee uh, doesn't mean it's necessarily good for you. I think, yeah, I've, I've read some of that research. It's like SIP 1A2 or something like that. I can't exactly, remember. Exactly, yeah. So those are the people, if you have a slow phase one, cytochrome P450 enzyme, mm -hmm. you can have coffee like right before bed and still sleep fine, right? Mm -hmm. Is that it? Or, yeah. or I'm saying that backwards. Opposite, if you have a fast, fast. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's out of there very quick. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. okay. And I still find, so that's, so they were looking at the genotype, but I still find that the phenotype varies as well. You know, the more coffee someone drinks, the faster they're going to be able to metabolize it. And I'm sure if you took a slow metabolizer who was drinking lots of coffee, that they would still maybe even metabolize it faster than a fast metabolizer who doesn't drink a lot of coffee. Mm -hmm. So I think that still plays into it. But again, in my practice, I'm looking at each person as an individual. Yeah. And if someone comes to me and they're like, yeah, I have one to two a week, I love the taste, I don't notice any symptoms when I'm not on it, go ahead, drink yeah. your coffee. I don't think there's an issue. Right. But if people tell you I'm a train wreck if I don't have it, then we know there's an issue. Yeah. 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 You know what? It's funny with social media. I've, I've found that coffee is an addiction for people. I mean, like, there's a lot of memes and shirts and, and people, <laughs> you know, if I don't have my coffee, everything's better with coffee. There's a million right. things that are pretty right. funny. And we all think, oh yeah, yeah, that's cool, because it's like you know anyone under the age of 18 throughout the world can buy coffee at any coffee shop without an ID. But it is caffeine is a drug. I mean, it does have pharmaceutical-like properties mm -hmm. and so forth. Interesting. So I like that. So let's say someone says, you know what, I'm a train wreck if I don't have coffee. My day's not the same. Where do we start? Adrenal adaptogens, meditation. Where do we? All of the above. So yeah. I always ta attack from a few different angles. We always give recommendations in diet as a foundational type thing. So in this situation, maybe we, we make sure they're on a low glycemic index, low glycemic load diet, so their blood sugar's not all over the place. Then we look at some therapeutic foods. What are specific foods within the context of that diet that are going to help you with your specific issue? So maybe we're adding fats, more fats to the diet, so their blood sugar is you know more level. Maybe some coconut oil or flax oil or something that's going to level that out. Then we're thinking about lifestyle. Okay, so you know, um, getting more rest, you know, meditating, uh, maybe even taking a nap, a power nap in the afternoon if that's possible. So rejuvenating, getting their health, health dollars back in the bank account. Mm -hmm. And then we might go to supplements. So we might go to, um, you know, some adaptogens, adrenal glandulars, certain nutrients that support the adrenals like vitamin C and vitamin B5. And uh, for coffee, I really like to help people wean off of that with green tea. Mm -hmm. So green tea, you're still gonna get 30, 40 milligrams of caffeine per cup, and it has the L-theanine in it to sort of balance that out. So it gives you a, a bit of a kick, but it also helps calm you down a little bit. 
um, less caffeine, and you get all that great benefits from the catechins in there, which mm -hmm. are powerful antioxidants. So it's kind of a win-win-win there when you uh, wean them off. I love it. You were having green tea right now, or before the interview, uh, right? Ginger tea, actually. Ginger, but oh, okay. I, like, I like green tea sometimes during yeah. the day, yeah. This is a little late. We're filming this, folks, around 6 p.m., so you wouldn't have tea, green tea this late. No, never. Yeah. Okay. I, I, usually, I wouldn't really have it past 1, 2 o'clock. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're a sluggish metabolizer. Mm -hmm. I yeah. am a slow metabolizer. Yeah. Actually, my wife is a fast metabolizer. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So when you guys travel and go on vacation, will you go out and have coffee? No, never. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, we've both cut it out completely. Wow. And you cut out beer, too. I want, maybe we'll switch gears a little bit to alcohol because um, that's a, a great way or a way that people use to calm themselves down, unfortunately, mm -hmm. right? Uh, excessive alcohol. And we hear, again, just like coffee, like coffee, some of the data on coffee that I was attracted to, well, uh, it improves bifidobacterium, it improves diversity of the microbiome, the polyphenols do all these great things. So you're making excuses for why you're consuming it. Same thing I found myself making excuses for drinking alcohol. It's good for your right, heart right. health, you know, it lowers LDL cholesterol and all that. So let's talk about the alcohol. You mm -hmm. know, um, as we talked about adrenals. And I've heard from practitioners, and I haven't found any science on this, but I know this to be fairly true. Uh, when you're drinking a lot of alcohol, it does affect the adrenals and sleep and blood sugar regulation. Um, so transitions off alcohol and recommendations around that. Mm -hmm. Transitions off alcohol. Um, so for someone who just kind of has it daily to help them relax? Yeah, the cocktail at night, a couple glasses of mm -hmm. wine. Well, I think, you know, when it comes to stress, Stress processing is so important. So um, in my detoxification course, we talk about the five channels of elimination, the bowels, the kidneys, the lungs, and the skin, and the mind, mm. which everyone forgets, right? So if we have things coming into our nervous system where we're not processing them out, it, they get caught and they can actually cause disease. Uh, so sometimes people use alcohol, and of course there's constructive ways and there's destructive ways to stress process. Alcohol would be a destructive way because although you feel better, it's still depleting you of nutrients at the end of the day because alcohol has ethanol, which is a poison, and then we have to detoxify it. The, the way I really like to get rid of uh, damaging habits is to swap them out with other habits. So this might be a hard sell for some people, but doing, you know, having a tea ritual mm -hmm. instead of that alcohol. Uh, doing something that you really enjoy, even you know, watching a television show that's really you know helps you de-stress. Taking a bath, um, you know, going for an infrared sauna, going for a walk after work, you know, doing all these things that help to process that stress, but aren't necessar necessarily adding harm to the yeah, body. That's a really good tip. Just swap it out, um, mm -hmm. because if you go through that same routine of coming home to work, making dinner, and you're accustomed to just pouring in a glass of wine, then it just, it, it be, it's hard to break. And For so sure. um, what I've done is I use a Zymogen Relax Max in the wine glass to break mm -hmm. that habit so it's still kind of purplish and, and it has like theanine and GABA and taurine and inositol so it, it really helps take that edge off. And it's, you're still like participating in the habit but you swap the a poison for something that's very restorative. Cool, uh, yeah, I love that. And um, we do similar things as well. We will do uh, like a blueberry juice. There's mm -hmm. this really great wild blueberry juice we get and we'll fizz up some water. Do you have a soda stream? I don't. No. Soda streams are amazing. They, okay. You can just take any great clean water and just fizz it up. Cool. Um, so we uh, you know, use, use the fizzy water and a little blueberry juice or like pomegranate juice or kombucha is really nice yeah. too. Yeah, so I, I love kombucha, but we've started making our own and mm -hmm. drinking a lot of it. And I went to my dentist. I don't think I've told you this yet. And normally it's squeaky clean. You know, he's an integrative dentist and he goes, mm -hmm. <clears throat> he like takes off his glasses. You know? like, <laughs> Mike, what's new in your life? I'm like, yeah, everything's good. He's like, you know what? You have a cavity forming here. We see a lot of like, um, you know, he has this, uh, he plates, does a little small culture of, of your teeth and then puts it onto a screen so you can see all the bacteria move around and it was significantly higher than it's ever been. And mm. so um, I told him about the kombucha. You know, that yeah, we've been drinking a, you know, a fair amount of that and even, you know, there's a local company that now makes kombucha beer so we've been having some of that. And he said, he goes, I gotta tell a story with you, a local, this is in Seattle, one of the big companies, he wouldn't tell me the name. But uh, the owner, founder of that company is a patient of his and she has like five or six cavities now and all that. So mm -hmm. I love kombucha, mm -hmm. but I just want to throw that little caveat in that like we hear, oh yeah, it's acidic and all that, but there, it really, this is a personal story for me in the sense like it hit home that the acidity, I haven't had a cavity since I'm like five years old or right. so. Yeah. Right. So 
again, not to say don't drink kombucha. Yeah, However, yeah. it's a nice replacement, as you were saying, with alcohol. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is your kombucha sweet when you drink it? I usually get the GTs. Mm -hmm. um, just there's a few other brands too, sweet. Right. But yeah, it is fairly mm -hmm. sweet. Um, yeah. So what I found is that different companies will let it ferment at different amounts. Yeah. So when you make it yourself and you leave the scoby in there, you leave it fermenting until it's all the sugar's been basically metabolized, mm. it gets more vinegary, like it's not as sweet, yeah. and that takes care of more of the sugars. But yeah, yeah a lot of them out there like that are pre-made are pretty sweet. Yeah. So I question how much sugar is actually still in there. Right, they're doing the short fermentation on that, mm -hmm. most likely, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, the tip that the dentist said is if you do have kombucha, which again, we're not saying don't, it's a right. great, great, you know, it's rich in probiotic yeast, probiotic bacteria, mm -hmm. but just swish thoroughly afterwards. Cool. Yeah. So he's recommending that. Okay, so speaking of ferments, um, you your, you and your wife recently, or she did a sauerkraut fermentation course. Let's talk mm -hmm. about some of the things you're making at home in terms of ferments and kind of the learning curve there and what to expect. Yeah, yeah, so my wife's like the pro with that one. She just uh, released a fermentation course. So we have like fermented stuff everywhere. And some of the ones that we just love to have as staples uh, is, and I even have some here in the clinic, is sauerkraut, mm -hmm. super easy to make. Um, and the cool thing is that if you've ever made sauerkraut, you know you're not adding bacteria to it, right? It's already on the vegetable. So these are what Donna Gates calls first generation bacteria that are in the soil, they're there. And they're super powerful at setting up shop in the gut. So you just like mash the crap out of your, your sauerkraut, you let it sit in a, in a salty brine, and then it, it ferments and it's a wonderful and you can do a ton at one time. Mm -hmm. So we have those, we have pickles. Uh, there's a wonderful local uh, company that makes these amazing fermented pickles that we have. Um, Megan will make some cheeses sometimes, mm. which are nut great, cheeses? like nut or? cheeses, okay. yeah, yeah, which are super delicious. And uh, kombucha, she makes a lot of kombucha. That's awesome. But it sounds like the sauerkraut is a mainstay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And another one actually that we've got onto recently, super easy, is coconut yogurt. Oh. We basically take coconut milk, you add a couple capsules of probiotics to it, let it sit on the counter, and it's like fermented the next morning. So awesome. Yeah. Yeah, we'll put a link below this video on the fermentation course. I think people are excited about that because, you know, when my wife and I first started getting into it, and I've actually never personally done it by myself, fermenting, I've just been kind of helping her out a little bit. I don't know when it's done. And right. is, it, is it rotten? Is it like there yet? So any... Again, we hope people click the link below to kind of check out your wife's course, but um, any tips there like to overcome that fear that, oh, this is toxic or it's gone too far? Right, yeah, I think a lot of it just comes from experience, but mm. from when I found something that's not so good, you know right away. Yeah, I mean, tastes. the mold is there or it tastes bad or the color has turned dramatically. Uh, so when you start doing it, you sort of become familiar with that. Mm -hmm. So are you in a cycle where some are brewing, some are in the fridge, some are preserved? I mean, yeah, you guys we have... go in phases. We yeah. go in phases, yeah. So there's not something always going. We're not that yeah. hardcore. Uh, but um, sometimes, yeah, we do get a, a process going. Yeah. Well, speaking of you know, kind of circling this conversation back to where we started with digestion, um, mm -hmm. I spent a fair amount of time in, in Asia and it's, there's kimchi and sauerkraut before and after every meal. Mm -hmm really interesting, uh, particularly in South Korea. Um, so I, I found that to be, you know, a, a nice way to boost digestive health. And so when you're traveling and, and, you know, experiment and eat different cultural, you know, based foods. But again, that's something that we're not doing here uh, in North America. We're not having those ferments. So oh, absolutely. do you recommend uh, folks finish off a meal with or just add it in or before? I think, I think at any point it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's going to, I mean, when you eat a meal, that pyloric sphincter shuts off anyway, right? Mm. And it's all in there, it's all in the stomach and it's all gonna get processed at the same time. So if we get those probiotics in any time during the meal, I think it's gonna be beneficial. We don't have to worry too much yeah. about when those bacteria make it. You know, indigenous cultures have been making fermented foods for thousands of years mm -hmm. and they made their way down there somehow. So yeah, yeah. so don't overthink it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just found it interesting, like in Asia, it's before and after like as a digestive That's and cool. then also the way to finish off the meal. Um, and they were enamored with how interested we were in uh, the fact that they were bringing in this, this kimchi. Nice. Uh, so Josh, let's finish up on hair. 
Uh, you have beautiful hair if you can't, if folks can't see. So if there was, if, if hair vitality was a, a metric of health, you would be like off the Richter scale. Um, so what, I'm sure you get this question a lot with women and men as well, losing hair, and we know that there's hormonal issues, there's toxicity issues, thyroid, there's a lot there, but uh, from a nutrition standpoint, functional medicine standpoint, where do you address thinning hair? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the key places I go to, the most common is a hormone called DHT, dihydrotestosterone. So mm -hmm. if we follow down the cascade of hormonal production from cholesterol, testosterone can get converted into DHT, which is many times stronger, and that can affect the hair follicle and stop hair growth, stun hair growth. So uh, it's a very simple blood test to actually get checked, and there's actually labs that are testing it in the urine now. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Dutch test. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, so it's super simple to get, and, and it just tells us like how much of that testosterone is converting into that. There's certain drugs on the market used for hair loss, and what do they do? They wow. target the 5-alpha reductase enzyme, which converts testosterone to DHT. Yeah. Uh, there's also research showing that green tea helps to keep your hair nice and healthy. Hmm. And of course, there's key minerals like uh, silicon, um, which is really abundant in an herb called horsetail. Uh, oat straw has silicon in it, so those are great herbs that you can drink as a tea regularly, as a tonic to help with the hair. Yeah. Uh, biotin is really important for the hair. Yeah. So I think it's you know just another expression of living the holistic life. life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, have you recommended like the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors? I think Propecia is one for men. I know they do have a lot of potential long-term in, in a small subset of people that can actually permanently suppress that enzyme. I, I've mm -hmm. heard there's interesting research. So I don't think it's the best medicine out there, but um, have you recommended men get on that if, if their DHG is pretty high? Not the drug. Okay. Good. I can't make drug recommendations, yeah, yeah. nor would I. But there's uh, some really great herbs that do similar things, like saw palmetto. Mm -hmm. uh, nettle, nettles can be helpful too. And taking those just regularly to help prevent that instead of one of these drugs yeah. um, is a great way to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay, f so for women, because I do see this a lot more so than I remember. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of women, and actually, gosh, my wife and I were watching, somehow this YouTube video popped up and it was this woman's um, pre-work routine. So what she would do is she had uh, she was an overweight woman, you know, in her bathroom. Uh, it's on YouTube. It's crazy. So she spray paints her head black, to so, so the d difference between her hair and her skin wasn't very drastic. And then right. she would paint in some things and tuck this. And it was like this routine. And I've seen a lot of women like that, you know, um, not with I don't know if they do that, you know, pre-work routine with their hair. But there's a lot of factors that go into that um, in terms of from a like in a mental emotional standpoint, confidence level. What have you found with women uh, with thinning hair? Or with thinning hair, yeah. Um, that often goes back to thyroid. Mm -hmm. You know, So we're going to do a full thyroid panel, look at all the different levels, see if there's an underlying thyroid issue there, because thinning hair is one of the key symptoms associated with that. Yeah. Um, also what's interesting is uh, people who are gluten sensitive actually get a hairline that starts to kind of work its way back, yeah. and they'll get kind of a bigger forehead. Mm -hmm. And I actually remember way back, we were talking about this before, in uh, Thomas O'Brien's lecture, he was talking about um, forehead size and its correlation to celiac disease. Yeah. So that was super interesting. And sometimes you can just even see it right away on people. Mm -hmm. um, so they would definitely have to eliminate gluten. That would be a key factor. Yeah. So I think it always comes back again to what the underlying cause is. Right. Okay, because I know there is like insulin resistance and PCOS mm -hmm. in women that drive the androgens, which precipitate the hair loss and, and all that. So really a good functional medicine practitioner can help folks with that. For sure, and I mentioned uh, d testosterone converting into DHT. Mm -hmm. That also happens in women. So we can use herbs that are typically targeted at men for women as well if they have similar hormonal issues as you just mentioned. You know, yeah. If they are driving to the androgens and that's converting into DHT, then they could probably benefit off things like soft palmetto as mm -hmm. well for at least a short term. Yeah, to see to get things on track. Mm -hmm. So the Dutch test, I know there's a serum DHT that you can run to, but you found the Dutch test to be a little bit better 
to look at the DHT? Is that what you're saying? You know what? The jury's still out on that with me. Yeah. I just recently learned about the Dutch test, so we're yeah. just starting to implement that in our practice. Right, right. Because I know there's two different forms of the DHT metabolite, the alpha and beta, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't explored this too much. But anyway, we'll talk about that in more depth on, on another podcast, folks. But Josh, as we kind of wrap up here, anything that you wanted to chat about regarding nutrition, functional medicine that we didn't get to discuss? Yeah. I mean, I think it all goes back to the fundamentals. We were talking yeah. about this last time that, and one of the things I mentioned to you was that no matter how many biochemical pathways you learn, no matter how many books you read, no matter how many studies you look into, how many interviews you watch, how many summits you attend, <laughs> how many conferences, um, it all goes back to the fundamentals. Yeah. You have to drink good water, you have to eat good food that's nutrient dense, you have to get good sleep, you have to move your body, you have to have stress management, and if you can nail down those and put a ton of energy into those, all the other stuff becomes fine tuning mm -hmm. and works way better. I love that. Yeah, so don't don't gloss over the basics. Yeah, a lot of people jump mm -hmm. into something like exogenous ketones because it's the latest thing right, right. now with without a dr and they're still on their iPhone until midnight and like, <laughs> having all exactly. these issues. Exactly. But you mentioned something that you do. Uh, you mentioned movement and exercise, which is really important, but it doesn't always have to be at the gym. Like, so talk to people how you get to work every day. Yeah, I bike to work every day. It's awesome. I love it. I mean, just getting on that bike, and it's about a 15 minute bike ride, mm -hmm. getting that blood flow going to my head um, just makes me work so much better. I'm so much more on, I'm so much more productive. Yeah. And then at the end of the day, it's not a super vigorous bike ride, um, it helps me to release the cortisol and just kind of unwind and I love that break at the beginning of the end yeah and I'm a big fan I've I've come a long way in the way I work out and move my body over the years and I'm a big fan of doing the activity that you'll stick with keeping it uh, different doing a lot of different things mm -hmm. and doing stuff you enjoy yeah you said you've come a long way so what is that what does that really mean yeah if I look back to like university when I was working out it was all about building big muscles, yeah. going to the gym, working out for atrophy, you know, using machines and isolation and everything. And of course, you know, that always led to injuries. Yeah. And then over the years, it's less vanity centered, more health centered, I just want to feel good. And it's doing lots of different things. Mm -hmm. So I like to do yoga, I like to do different types of yoga, I like to do a nice hard weight workout, I like to do CrossFit sometimes, I like to bike, I like to play squash, yeah. I like to walk. I mean, in my old age, <laughs> if you could call it that, I just love walking. I yeah. mean, it's one of the times where I feel my most creative. It, it uh, just makes me feel uh, so relaxed and uh, yeah, so. That's awesome. So switching it up, which is really neat. Yeah, you know, another, speaking of questions like how we launch this, another question I get is I'm just, I feel like I'm doing everything right in the gym and I'm not getting the results I want. And so maybe people are doing, like you said, isolation exercises, not moving their entire body, not getting fresh air, to, like being a little bit too myopic about what they're doing in terms of their fitness. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I know um, uh, Tim Ferriss says, you know, the way to get really strong and to, to build a lot of muscle, you go to the largest person in the gym, you ask them what they're doing and you do the exact opposite. <laughs> because that person, it came easy to them, mm. right? It's like they were built for that. And what he's really interested in, of course, I'm sure you know, is looking at the outliers. Um, so, you know, if you don't find that you're getting the results, do something different. Yeah. I've been a member of so many gyms just for living in different places. And I love to work out in the morning. So there's always that one, that crew, that morning yeah. crew, yeah. that's there every single day. They're usually like, 50 to 70 year old men they're socializing and they're doing the same thing every day yeah and their body looks the exact same it did probably for the past 10 20 years mm -hmm. so you got to keep the body guessing when it comes to exercise yeah that's really funny you know so when i was 18 i worked at a gold's gym in in uh, san francisco area and i go my mom lives there so i go back periodically you know to visit for, we're going for thanksgiving and whatnot and I go to the gym, if I go at like three o'clock or th between three and five, the time that I would normally work out, I see these same exact people doing the same exercises, yeah. <laughs> you know, and yeah, they haven't gotten bigger or fatter or skinnier, but they look pretty much the same. And it's just so funny because, you know, it's like we talked about habits with alcohol. We have gym habits. We mm -hmm. go there and we're comfortable. 
we get a little progress with the one workout that we like and we kind of cycle through that and that's just what we do. Mm -hmm. So that novelty, like you're talking like with Tim Ferriss, novelty and parkour and yoga and all this, it's really good for the muscles and the brain as well. Mm -hmm. uh, key aspects, so you mentioned morning a little bit, the morning crew, we wanna know Josh, your morning routine. We know successful people have a set of morning routines, rituals, you know, habits that they go through. Walk us through what the first couple hours of your day looks like. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I wake up and the first thing I do is I have a drink of something. Sometimes it's just water, sometimes it's a little water with lemon juice, sometimes it's some detox concoction that I make pulling it out of the cupboards. Uh, most of the time it's just water. Then I like to uh, work out, go to the gym, um, or I do a yoga flow at home. Mm. Uh, it sort of depends, I like to alternate. And then I sometimes I'll put in a meditation there, depending on the day, I'm not religious with it. I kind of do it when I feel like I want to. Mm. Uh, then I have my breakfast. Cool. And then I'm off to work, biking to work, um, usually. Yeah, so you're probably getting up 5, 5.30 type of thing? Like no. Pretty early? Okay. <laughs> I get up about 6.30ish is my ideal. Yeah, but you, you like to do either weight training or yoga in the morning? Absolutely. One of the two. Yeah, yeah. Th that's what I do most commonly. Yeah, and then uh, because you have an online brand, you, that's it, you have online courses and all that, pretty big Instagram following. Mm -hmm. um, do you, when do you get on social media? Because a lot of people are like, that's one of the first things they do and it's, it's, there's like a draw to like reconnect with the world. Uh, any habits or tips you know, to create some barriers or boundaries around that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, usually I'll, when I first get to work, I'll check in with social media. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, if I'm Instagramming, I kind of do it at random times based yeah. on you know, when I take that picture and yeah. feel like I want to post it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But um, me and my wife, we actually have some really uh, good rules that we live by. Uh, and that we follow where we're never using uh, technology at meal times and we never use technology past 10 p.m. Wow. No I phones, like no TVs, no bright screens, no nothing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so um, to really enforce that boundary, are you like locking the phone somewhere or do you just put it on airplane mode? Yeah, at, uh, at night we just turn our phones off. Oh cool. Yeah, and we also t unplug our internet as well. Right at, at 10, yeah. Yeah. We, yeah, we, I unplug it usually like 10.30, that's mm -hmm. what I do. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I'm like posting podcasts late or doing some, yeah. you know, you, it, it's, it can it be happens. a bugger. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so what do you use for an alarm clock then? I don't use an alarm clock. Yeah. I think the best alarm is your body alarm. Mm -hmm. And um, it's been years since I haven't used an alarm clock. I hate that feeling of waking up with an alarm. And I think that you should be going to bed and planning your day the day before to allow for waking up. If you're waking up with an alarm, you're not done. Mm -hmm. And sleep is one of the most sacred things for me. You know, when I say going back to the fundamentals, yeah. if I don't get my sleep, I'm not even close to my full potential. Mm -hmm. So I uh, put a lot of effort to get good sleep. Yeah. Speaking of routines and sleep and all that, any biometric devices that you use, like HeartMath or Muse apps or heart rate variability testing or blood glucose testing, or you just go more intuitive based upon how you feel? Yeah. I mean, I have played around with heart rate variability. I was using the uh, HeartMath meditation device for a while uh, when I was doing my meditations. And uh, there was a device I was using, HRV for training, yeah. which was really just for my own personal interest. I wasn't uh, following it or you, you know using it as a guide. I was just curious to know what my heart rate variability was. But yeah. no, I don't use any okay. devices. Yeah, and just curiosity. Uh, so I've interviewed Marco Altini, who created that app, heart, HRV for training. Cool. What did you think about it? I thought it was great. Yeah, yeah it was super informative, really interesting. Yeah. And uh, I even would check it at times where I knew my heart rate variability was really good mm -hmm. or not so good, and it was direct correlation, so it was yeah. really cool. It's a pretty cool app. Yeah, a lot of, we did a dinner talk, as you know, last night, and a lot of doctors hadn't heard of it, so it's, I recommend that, just to check in. You know, it's not like you have to be religious and do it every single oh, day. Um, yeah, but it's good to see because low HRV, as you know, Josh, is linked with heart disease, cancer, all-cause mortality, sudden cardiac death, there's a lot of ailments linked with that, so. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. All right, so let's transition a little bit to your favorite herb, nutrient, or whole food. You're on a desert island, vitamin D and omega-3 and water are covered. Okay. What are you gonna bring with you? <laughs> um, I love adaptogens. Um, they, like, I can really feel them when they're working. Mm -hmm. um, one of, you know, ginseng is a great one. It's one of the most uh, sought after herbs in the world and for good reason. I mean, I think ginseng roots have gone for like upwards of $400,000 at auctions in wow. China. 
It's amazing. It's, it's crazy. And actually at the herbal firm that I worked at, the guy who ran the program was a ginseng dealer. He actually mm. helped farmers subsidize their farm by helping them grow ginseng. Really? Interesting. Anyway, I'm going off track, but yeah. ginseng, I, I love it. It's, it. It makes me feel great. Sometimes I you know, cycle on and off of it. Mm. And adaptogens really help you um, adapt to stress and yeah. you know, put out your best work and, and um, sleep better, work better, have more energy. Yeah. So that would be maybe my first herb just to throw on out there. Food, did we talk about? Well, just one, yeah, let's hear the food. What do you, what do you got? Um, my top food on a desert island. Am I like being intellectual about this? Or am I just <laughs> <laughs> no, just, yeah, just something that you would really want to take with you and then there's gotta be maybe a reason as to why. Okay, yeah. okay, so I have, to, I have to go the intellectual route. Plus yeah. it would probably be the thing I would take and it's coconut. Nice. Like coconut, coconut oil, super powerful, mm. great energy, good fat, um, the water, hydration, yeah. the meat, good food. And um, if I was with my wife, I would make a bikini out of her out of the shells. There you, you go. Know, so good utility too. Multi-purpose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So going back to ginseng, so there's Panax ginseng, American ginseng, um, all of the above, or do you recommend certain ones for different people and phenotypes? Yeah, I've played around with different ones. In From a Chinese medicine perspective, some are hot or some are colder, some are more yin, some are more yang. Um, I like uh, American ginseng quite a bit. I also like Eleuthero, which is Siberian ginseng, um, which is called ginseng. It's not a true ginseng, but it's also, it just, it just feels really good. Mm -hmm. Love it. Um, yeah, ginseng's amazing. I've, I've had really good feedback with that, and also ashwagandha. I love ashwagandha as well. Uh, okay, so Josh, you're in an elevator with a politician, maybe a U.S. president, a prime minister of Canada, someone from the World Health Organization. What are you going to tell them in 30 seconds about health? About health. I'm going to tell them that, um, <laughs> well, one of the things that I do with my clients is I explain to them what health is. So we have this false sense of what health is. We go to the doctor, we get checked up, we get blood work, and they say, oh, continue doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So everyone thinks that health is either this black and white thing. I'm either diagnosed with a disease or not. But I would explain to this politician that's a, that it's a continuum. Like a forest, you walk into a forest, everything's either growing or dying. Mm -hmm. There's nothing stagnant. Even a rock is probably turning into dust very slowly. So the human body is the same way. We're either moving towards health or away from health on what I call the slope of health. Yeah. So I would say you need to use the slope of health as a new model for our health healthcare system and uh, explain to people that it's not black and white, it's you're moving towards, you're moving away, and you have to do things to stay at the top of that slope of health. And it's not just a matter of getting checked up and getting looked at, it's a matter of being proactive and being at the center of your healthcare team and your healthcare picture. I love, that's very beautiful. You know, uh, one of my mentors, a high school football coach actually told me, and this is very pertinent to football and it, you'll get with it in a second, but in, in the game of football, you're either moving forward or backwards. Mm. And that's so true in life too. So you mentioned, and so uh, for the folks, you know, that are seeing a traditional doctor that doesn't understand that the absence of disease does not equate vitality, right? So that trajectory is really, really important. And so I think it's, people need to take the onus on themselves to take steps every single day to, to move towards health. And I love that you articulated that, Josh, because you, I, when I look at you, you're very vital, you're full head of hair, no wrinkles and all that. So you can really, you know, you're a good salesman for that, for that you know, way of living and that, that new mindset. Mm -hmm. So I commend you for that. So Josh, I really appreciate this conversation. I'm grateful for all the teachings that you shared and, and very uh, delivered them in an authentic way. If people want to learn more about your clinical practice, and then I know in, for Canadians and maybe people throughout the world, I'm not sure, you do a, a certification program. So let's talk about both of those resources. Absolutely. So um, if they want to find more about my practice, they can go to joshgitalis.com. Also through joshgitalis.com, there's information about my certification program, which is a functional nutrition certification program. Um, it's comprehensive. We look at different systems of the body. We look at supplements and food for healing in great depth. We even have a couple uh, workshops as part of the program on looking at blood work and doing functional lab testing. Cool. And at the highest level, I actually do one-on-one -on -one, uh, sessions with people to work through case studies, you know, if they're choosing the practitioner level. That's really so, awesome. So yeah, it's super awesome. Um, I've been teaching some of these courses for six, seven years, and uh, we've been put it together as a program in the past couple years. 
we have, and we usually have registration in September uh, or a session starting in September, a session starting in January. Awesome. Year. Okay, we'll have links below this video and on the show notes page. And what I think is unique, and I'll just you know plug you a little bit, Josh. So I've been working with healthcare practitioners for ten years, and most nutritionists that I meet are part time. They're you know like a stay at home mom that wants to stay busy and help out their relatives, but. You have a full thriving practice, you know, with with assistance. You're hiring someone, an associate under. So yeah, you really know what you're doing. You you know the knowledge and and have the ability to really keep more and more clients coming in and, and so forth. So I commend you for that. So oh, thank you keep so up much. the awesome work. Thanks yeah. for coming on the show. This oh, was it was a, a pleasure. Yeah, I thank loved you. it. We should do it again for sure. Yeah.